Hey friends, how's it going? Welcome to Tea Cakes and Tarot, Conversations with Queer Futurists. I am your host, Will Wilhelm. It's so nice to see you all. So if you are new to this space, thank you so much for coming. I can't wait to tell you a little bit about what we're gonna do. And for those of you who are returning, it means so much to me to have you here again, to take a little space. Um, you know, to dream about the future that we're about to manifest, y'all. Things are happening out here in these streets. So um, please tell me, as some of you already are, where you are coming in from. I am going to be drinking some tea. Um, so tell me if you're sipping on something special as well. And what we're going to do today is um, we're going to share space with a beautiful friend. Tea Cakes and Tarot is my little experiment at creating queer community in this virtual space. So what I love most about the queer artists and makers in my life is their ability to sort of creatively work of work around problems and to invent in the way that I think only a queer sensibility teaches you how to bring. So we're gonna be doing that with a new friend who I'm gonna introduce you to and we're gonna share their talents and insights. And um, then I'm gonna provide them with a tarot reading. But before we do all of that, I want to see how you are and what's going on with y'all. So how we do that here is with a poll that's coming at you right now. And it's about Gemini season starting tomorrow. So I'm gonna read that for you. Uh, Gemini season starts tomorrow. And what effects are you looking forward to feeling? Are you gonna be a social butterfly, um, the twin sign of communication and connection? So you're trying to meet and greet. Feel free to respond to these as I, as I read, by the way. Are you rebelling uh, against inspiring some mischief, thirsty for good chaos? Well, master vax or both, I hope. Um, that's kind of me. Brainiac, we've got these dueling perspectives. So we're figuring out some critical thinking, maybe figuring out what Clubhouse is eventually. I've downloaded it, still haven't really used it. Or the only double you see in your future is a gin and tonic in a public place. I think I'm all of these. Um, <laughs> but I respect that y'all can only pick one of them. So what are you most feeling right now? I'm loving these responses and I think we're ready to publish it. A lot of you are feeling twin season gin and tonic. This is just tea, but as soon as this is over, it will be more than tea, trust and believe. Okay, thank you for doing that. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, and I appreciate you um, sharing how you're feeling. So. As I mentioned, I'm gonna be providing a little tarot reading and we do a special one here on Tea Cakes and Tarot. What we do is one card from the Major Arcana, which I'll explain in a little bit um, for those of you that don't know a lot about tarot. Um, and I use the Star Spinner deck by a Vietnamese, Mer uh, Vietnamese American artist named Trungles. It's really gorgeous. So you get to see one of those cards. And then we have a special Island Shakespeare Festival, Tea Cakes and Tarot Sonnet deck. So these are Shakespeare's sonnets and I'm gonna be pulling one of them as well for our guest. All right. If you have any guests, any thoughts that you wanna share, please feel free to use the chat. That is your way to make yourself known in this space. And at that time, at this time, and if you are moved by anything that you see, feel free to donate to the Island Shakespeare Festival. Okay, that's all we got. We're ready to rumble. Today, I'm so excited about the new friend that I'm sharing with y'all. They are, I didn't even think a multi-hyphenate is the right word. They are a community organizer. They are a mutual aid organizer. They're obviously an artist. They're a writer. They, as you'll meet in a second, they have an ability to, like I said, creatively think around all of the things that face our, all of the challenges that we face as a community. And so I'm really excited to talk more about how they bring artistry to all of that. My wonderful guest today is artist, writer, actor, and all around badass, Yehan Osanyin. And here they are. Hey, Bae. Hi, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. 
It is my pleasure. I can't wait to talk more about um, what it is you do in the way that only you do it, which, you know, I think it's true of all of us, but the more I get to know about you and your work, the more I realize um, you have these amazing abilities to, like, <laughs> to, to, you have these amazing abilities to, like we said, like we always invite queer futurists to this program. And I just see you creating this future. So I want to let the audience hear a little bit about what you're doing from your perspective and from your mouth. So will you start us off with just a little bit about the work that you're doing with a company you created called Earthseed and how, how that sort of works? I sure will. So Earthseed is an organization that I started a long time ago by a different name, but it uses theater in wild spaces to decolonize those spaces and the bodies that pass through them. And so when I say decolonize, it just means, not just, means a lot of different things, but it's about uh, developing our identities in accordance with our own beliefs and not just in opposition to oppressive constructs. And so using theater in the same way in which we understand text and we prepare to be witnessed on a stage, that's the same way in which I approach like professional development, racial equity, somatic um, embodiment, all of those things. And uh, oftentimes the vehicles I'll use to do that are theater, of course, but it's also the wilderness because there is uh, rarely a more unpredictable given circumstance dealer than the wilderness. And so like it really holds you up against, you know, yourself and the world. And it's like, who are you in this moment? Um, yeah, and so I'll canoe, I will um, whitewater raft, also whitewater canoe. Um, or backpacker go. I hate hiking because then I have to come back. Like it's a really hard thing. <laughs> but backpacking, like, oh, I get to get taken nap for several hours. Got it. Yeah. So that's the gist of what I do at Earth Sea. Oh. That's amazing. Yeah, please. Were you please were you about to say more? But I forgot the theater thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it also is the, the the company that hosts the things that I do, like staged readings of my works or before uh, Corona, um, I was putting up uh, Yankee Pick Me in the studio before I took it on the road. And also it's the company of when I work with young people, we have a youth ensemble. And so we um, did a, a piece called Grief, a 2019 Whale. Um, and so that uh, Earth Seed is the entity that hosts all of those things. Thank cool. you. Cool. Yes, I want to talk more about Yankee Pygmy in a second, but well, I'm I'm obsessed with what you just said about the wilderness as like the biggest provider of given circumstances, uncontrollable provider. And I'm curious, what do you think we tried to control less than the theater? Like, what do you think we let, in what ways can the theater be more like the wilderness is my oh. question. I love that. So one of the things that is super interesting to me is we cultivate so many things to a T and so many things are reliant upon the backstage storytelling is reliant upon front stage story. We're all, it's a great team and it's wonderful. And however, when we cultivate things like a set or things that are definite or even costume, that those things cannot change necessarily as quickly as the wilderness, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, because mm -hmm. here you'll be hiking and then it's all of a sudden it's snowing and then it's raining and then it's, and so not only is it about the, the temperature, it's also about how your body is acclimating to it. Also mm -hmm. how your body is acclimating to the other heartbeats of the people that are in your party as you're traveling through the wilderness. And so just like on stage and just like in humanity, our heartbeats are connecting and we're having empathy in, in the best case scenario. And that's the same thing in the wilderness, except with the, the varying given circumstances. Uh, I'm talking so fast. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> I was, this is slow for me. Me, I'm keeping me. Don't, yeah. me, to, me too. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> <laughs> I also can't see Brad, so I'm just like guessing at the pace. Uh, he is always doing incredible. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Brad. And now I'm making him sign about himself. <laughs> <laughs> Interview, Brad. Uh, so, uh, what was, the, I think, I don't remember because I got sidetracked. We were talking, you were talking about um, like the sinking of the heartbeat, which is like, oh, in case anyone yeah. doesn't know, that's more than a metaphor. That is something right. that has actually been studied. Mm -hmm. uh, it totally makes sense like on a hike, but in the theater as well, there is a synchronicity of heartbeats after people sit for a certain amount of time at the theater, which like, I don't know very much about science, but that blows my fucking mind. <laughs> I'm like, that's proof that Ooh. the theater is real and the theater teaches empathy. I'm sure a scientist would be like, those two things have nothing to do with each other, but I don't care. 
<laughs> no, and you also have the mirror neurons and things that are firing when you're hearing mm -hmm. a story. Yeah. So our, our physiology is definitely connected. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. I love that you, especially outdoor theater, we think of the elements as like the thing that we're working against. Like, oh, mm -hmm. we got rained out and I performed at the York and Shakespeare Festival. I was like, oh, the smoke. But it's like, <laughs> um, you, you're outside, you're in the elements, you're in the wilderness. You have to sort of invite that in as a part of the experience mm -hmm. because it is inevitable. It's not gonna be perfect weather every day. That is so cool. Um, Will you tell me also and tell us more about your solo show, Yankee Pickney? Sure. Uh, it, I wrote it in 20, oh, you know what? I was preparing for this interview and I was like, how do I prepare to speak about myself? You look at dates, yeah, yeah. What did I do and when did I do it? Exactly. I wrote it in 2017 and I was approached by this theater that is, uh, well, now defunct called Theater Schmader. And it was, I think, earlier on in the let's diversify our season uh situation that we have you know we found ourselves on the other side of in a different mm -hmm. way and so he asked about a solo show and I'd written one that I performed in Chicago many years ago but that just it just wasn't right and so then Yankee Pickney was one it was also it was 2017 and so the deaths uh, of or the murders of black bodies that were state sanctioned uh, by the police were really hitting me hard also there were several gun deaths in my own personal life, in my teaching professional life. And so guns played a huge role. And so when I, I thought about, because no one ever approached me to say, would you like to do a theater show as a part of our season, like a solo performance? And so I thought, let me take advantage of this. So what are the things that I wanna do? I wanna talk about these things that are affecting my life. I wanna have my dog. Um, and I would just like it to be um, honest. And so Yankee Pickney is me as a, a black bodied human being who's exploring what it means to be Jamaican and then uh, seen as a black person and then uh, seen as what I called white people black and then realizing my own blackness within my Jamaicanness. It's a lot about identity and it's also about gender and the ways in which uh, I, 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 what is it? I call myself a gender vacillator sometimes. And so when we put, you know, masculinity uh, or maskness with this black body that off, that also um, uh, has me intersecting with power in interesting ways. So uh, Yankee Pickney was about the exploration of all of that. And my dog roamed through the stage and it was really beautiful because he was with me for the whole run except the last weekend. And I took him out on the water because he'd gotten really sick. And we paddled in Lake Washington and he looked up at Seattle skyline and then he passed away in my boat. And like, uh, I was like on the river sticks, just paddling his body to the shore. And so it was like, oh, and that's the weekend that it ended. And it was a really meaningful show for me. And so all of those things happened. Yeah. That is- Wow. That last bit has me like literally speechless in a way that I'm not supposed to be right now <laughs> <laughs> like, to continue an interview. Um, <laughs> wow. That- sounds amazing i wish i i can't wait to see that in the future i know you're not done performing it um so i love that you you brought up the the gender vacillator because i actually you know when i was getting ready to when i was looking through all of your wonderful work i wrote down that oh. and i was like i wonder if, i wonder if that's like out of date um because i love to i i do not create these terms but i love to think of more like exciting terms to describe what gender is to me. So mm. I like to call myself a gender traitor. I just think that's mm. fun and subversive. Um, and I also like to, especially with my theater work, like to call myself gender imaginative yeah. because that also just speaks to what my experience of gender is. And saying like, oh, I'm a gender vacillator. I know exactly what that is. That's a very like specific, um, <laughs> like amazing way to talk about an ongoing relationship with gender that changes obviously from day to day. But the other thing that I, uh, that was what, that was included where I read that was um, Yehan is a gender vacillating one-sided storyteller. And I was like, <laughs> that's so funny and so fierce. I love describing myself as a one-sided storyteller. Cause like a, in a way, aren't we all? But like, will you tell me more about being a one-sided storyteller, which I love that you're just like, I, I'm owning up to this because like, what else am I going to, it's from my perspective. Yeah. <laughs> will you talk to me about claiming that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I have an interesting relationship with my biological parents. And, uh, and so I've had to go back and, and Yankee Pickney has so many journal entries from when mm -hmm. I was, I just slowed down my pace because Brad, I know you're still with us and thank you. So, 
<laughs> I had all of these journal entries and I've written in these journals since I was nine years old. And I looked back and that was the only record because of trauma, because of me being given away at 11, because of so many things that I only had this record of Yehan who wrote really hard things about being you know, hit by their parent. And, and, and there were um, marks that were Thank you, Peggy. Uh, there were marks that were on my body and I, I had this written record of myself in my own hand. And that was super powerful. And uh, it also then made me think about what are the ways in which that is trauma of me living in that moment and not necessarily remembering things that are correctly or, or remembering things correctly. Or what are the uh, ways in which my biological brother would have seen this differently or my parents would have seen this differently. And so I just tried so hard because I try to be kind and gracious mm -hmm. to all of the things that like to perspectives, it's what makes me such a great facilitator. Uh, and however, it does not make for good theater. <laughs> we need some drama and we need uh, the truth from one person's perspective at least. Mm -hmm. And so with the solo show, it felt like the the most important piece of that work was uh, focusing on my perspective on all of the, from all of the, if it was from Jennifer, if it was the conversations with my parents or my bio, my brother, it was really important for me to, for my own survival as bodies around me were dropping on the streets. Mm -hmm. Oh, how do I reconcile all of these things um, to heal? Yeah, that is amazing. And more power to you. Be that one-sided storyteller. Like that's that's what we're that's what we're here to explore. And that's what sharing, I think, empathy and humanity is. Uh, you know, like I, I just love that you wrote that in your bio because on paper that could be misconstrued as yeah. something negative that it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't Ooh. be. Um, I, I loved it. Um, is there anything I'm curious um so you said you did a solo show in Chicago so either from that first attempt or from all of the success of Yankee Pickney um like what did you learn about yourself um was was there any sort of like awakening or I don't know what did working on a solo show teach you about yourself I guess is my question I think working on a solo show told me that you need help <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, and here's that I am someone who does a lot with a little and have for such a really, really long time. And I also, though, I get really frustrated because bureaucracy is a, is a, is in the sinew of white supremacy and white body supremacy. And, mm -hmm. and I'm able to take my time often and that doesn't work for me because if I'm trying to change something, then that means something's not working. Mm -hmm. And so, uh. I literally I was, got lost at the word sinew. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what it taught you about yourself. Oh, yeah. But I, I love where you're going as far as when you are working against things, sometimes you feel like you have to do it all yourself if you want it done a different way that works better for you. Well, I think it's that. And I also just budget wise, it made, mm -hmm. it didn't make sense to me to, like we talked about, um, put a lot of work into having a set. But I just wanted to, because it felt weird to have the set cost so much money and then have uh, the fee for like a stage manager be $25, you know, like, it, and so I decided to look at the budget and put it in the people power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was great. And though, because of the limited uh, budget, it then reduced me to, oh, like, I can't actually find Black people who can afford to work on the show behind the scenes because of the way in which the resources were um, laid out and people power <laughs> and uh i also just i had my dog there as my emotional support piece but i also uh Alice, who i think is still here came in and did uh the video recording of it because people are like can i see it i mean no because i just i don't love being on camera but Alice had said you know this is something you want to remember and want to have recorded uh, I had my friend Jess Smith because I had to let go of the director shortly before rehearsals who came in and was my eyes for lighting, uh, particularly when I was on stage. And so I am someone who can do things by myself, but I also, someone on Twitter who was on Black Twitter was like, this is, was a Black woman. She said, I don't want to hear myself described as resilient ever again in my entire life. I mm -hmm. want to be soft. I want to be weak. And so that, like, that is the stage that I'm at. That's what I learned. But like I... I absolutely can do that. And I did it for so many years of my life. And like 
uh, spoil me, baby. Like, I'm trying to not work. Listen. <laughs> yes, you deserve some gentleness. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Victoria, um, do not have a manager. Uh, you want to hook me up with that, you don't hear? <laughs> I Literally, every time people are like, um, yeah, so like, uh, what's like, what's up next for you? Like, what do you have like in the wings? I'm like, I don't know. Do you have something for me? Is someone, <laughs> is someone gathered in this audience trying to offer me something right now? Do you know an artistic director? But like, I'd really love to see you play this role. I'm like, who do you know? Send them. <laughs> um, as I mentioned a little bit, you do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things. You mentioned you do facilitating work. We haven't talked about, I know you do a lot of mutual aid and community work. You do a lot of education work. And this is on top of all of your artistry, even though I think you approach all of those things with artistry, I would say. But do you, is there one sort of central mission that those all serve that ties them together or are they disparate to you? Well, so... I was raised within what, how they would identify themselves as a Judeo-Christian boarding school that's probably rooted, not probably, it's definitely rooted in white supremacy and white savior uh, complex. Mm. And so I was raised with the idea of to whom much is given, much is expected. And I was mm. like, yes, right? Like, I'm gonna do that. I believe in that. And then a pandemic happened and I was like, bitch, I'm fucking tired. Like, I'm tired. I don't know if I wanna be an actor anymore. Like, I don't know what is happening. And so like, before it was about being of service, before it was about healing, ooh, Brad, before it was <laughs> about being of service and it was about healing. And now I, I just want to be human and I want to take care and I want to be the princess version of a potato, like just, <laughs> let me not stress and it and I've made some decisions and um yeah especially in the pandemic and that's worked out for me in all of the spiritual ways in all of <laughs> princess fun yes t-shirts uh, I will make us those in my craft room <laughs> yeah I do I and so that's what's happening for me at this point my my art is uh, it's complete. It's shifted completely. I um, I don't know the direction completely, but I I'm excited for it to be from a place of ease. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> a place of ease and a place of I'm tired of the energy that doubt takes up in my brain. I'm tired of the mm -hmm. ener the energy that self hatred takes up in my brain. And I've dealt with that in very deep and like um, in ways that I'm surprised I made it out of. And uh, since I've gotten to this other side, I've realized like, oh, I'm actually never going to be at that place again because I'm now older, because the world is different. I may be deep and dark and hurting in a different way, but I now have like these different experiences. And so I'm choosing ease and I'm choosing myself. And that is probably what my art will also reflect me. Yes. I think part of ease and part of choosing yourself, I, I was reading an interview that you did um, for American Theater Magazine and something that you said in that, that I always try to echo, especially when I talk to young artists, like fresh out of school, I'm so eager to say yes to everything and be grateful to be here. You said something that really stuck with me that mm. was like, part of what makes me willing to be an artist is that I'm willing to walk away at any moment that it no longer serves me because this industry can be extremely abusive. And yes, it doles out abuse to, like in different ways to different people in different bodies with different experiences, but there is a potential for a lot of abuse for a lot of people. Will you, will you talk to me a little bit about what it means to have a healthy relationship with you as an artist and how that includes having other things that fulfill you so that if and when this does not provide you the space that you deserve, you are able to say goodbye or see you later. Can I ask a clarifying question? Of course, yeah. Uh, so you said that in the beginning, you said that has a healthy relationship with an artist, like someone having a healthy relationship with me or how to have a healthy relationship with me? Someone having, uh, I think you are modeling in that statement, how to have uh, a healthy relationship with the arts industry or your own artistry. And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of especially younger artists are ready to put themselves in harm's way for the opportunity or exposure. And I think that's so destructive and harmful, but it, it just happens. And, and, I, and I'm also saying that having been there, I'm sure you've been there, we've all been there. 
So, so I'm yeah. wondering what it took for you to arrive at that realization that you could be ready to walk away at any moment. And I think that that probably improves your artistry. Thanks for uh, uh, helping me understand that differently. Yeah. <clears throat> so something I think, uh, I, I'm on Twitter a lot. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> and I like one of the black Twitter like jokes that came through was the way in which uh, like you could die and a company will actually just hire someone the next day. Cause like you need to get the work done. Mm. And I uh, realized because of the, the life that, the, that I have lived and the body that I have, that I am absolutely disposable to some people. And I mean, when you learn that from your parents, like the people who are genetically supposed to keep you and they're just like, no, I'm good, right? Like what is, what is the world if those relationships can discard you? So uh, I, as I healed from all of those things and as I, I looked at and worked in corporate, the corporate world and worked in the corporate nonprofit world, mm -hmm. uh, I watched people be discarded. I watch students be discarded and I watch the putative way in which relationships are built. And I also watched and experienced the relationships that required my healing or the relationship that I uh, like uh, nurtured my healing. And, uh, and I started to believe in myself and love myself, uh, which I'm like laughing about, but it's absolutely what happened. And I, uh, and I, I read this one book uh, called Women Don't Ask. It was about salary negotiations and it talked about the ways in which and this is very binary but women don't ask for more money in the ways in which you know other folks do and so I started to think I was like oh do I really get that much as a black person I get so much less money than other people people are so willing to devalue me plus I have been devalued my whole life it comes from a place of weariness and so once I realized that I'm an awesome person <laughs> like I'm actually just a really great person. Um, and if there is something in my belly, if there's something in my neck, if there's something in my left nipple beneath my areola that tells me that I'm not supposed to be there anymore, part of my somatic embodiment and futuring journey is to honor this vessel that I'm going through this world in. Mm -hmm. And so I will listen to my body and time and time and time and time again, this body has taught me that the decisions I make are the right ones for myself and for others. And there have been countless times where people are like, oh, hey, you doing that thing actually opened up a door for me to do this other thing. And uh, while I'm not, uh, like, I'm not trying to be the, right, I'm trying to be soft, I'm not trying to pave the way necessarily, but mm -hmm. if me paving the way with softness, like, a, like it was a, a glacier carves through a, a mountain over time, if that's mm -hmm. a thing that we passage for people, absolutely. Um, and I will do it with fierceness because I protect my na naivete and my kindness with a fierceness. Yes, because like, thank you for like, we all need to be looking at each other and be like, I am fierce, I am awesome. And anyone can find me disposable, but I will never be disposable to my goddamn self, excuse mm -hmm. the language, but like, you know, that's, yes, a hundred percent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that we talk about on this um, on this series a lot, I'm curious to have your input in it, especially with regard to everything that we just talked about. We talk a lot about like classics and Shakespeare is just you know a topic that we include um, as we consider how to make those relevant to contemporary humans and bodies as we continue to how to as we consider how to excavate queerness like mm. it's really not that hard but um but you know to, <laughs> to find like a non-binary joy um mm. like within classics and and so i'm wondering like do you have a relationship with shakespeare at all do you have thoughts on shakespeare is it something you think about at all oh i love shakespeare i think about shakespeare a lot. My lexicons are right there. Oh, my cool. anthology of Shakespeare, like it, I love language and I love literature. And so one of the things that is, a, um, I was thinking about this, but as I was preparing for the interview by talking to myself, uh, <laughs> was like, what is my relationship with Shakespeare? And I uh, studied Shakespeare in the conservatory. I performed Sylvia into Gentlemen of Verona. Uh, I've performed Shakespeare before, but I don't often because I do so many artistic things. And uh, when I get a script, someone, and when I when someone asks me to audition, I read the entire script. Mm -hmm. I go through and I do the work. I've learned as a director, not everyone does that anymore. File on that one up here. But with Shakespeare, I don't necessarily have the time 
to read the entire text all over again, to go through the lexicon, to understand, oh, uh, phi means this here, and it means this here, <laughs> right? So like, and so one of the things I've been thinking about is, oh, just like brushing up on that Shakespearean monologue and getting mm-hmm. to audition for different things because I have worked on new works for so long. I have worked on like modern pieces or modern takes on slavery pieces. And I would love to, to play with Shakespeare again, uh, which can happen now that I have my, um, a schedule that works for me that I work three days a week for like five hours. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. And your own company to incubate that in your own way, because I would be really interested to see more of like, we talk about, you know, white supremacy and cis normativity and heteronormativity and all that. That's kind of not as like is ingrained in the text, but is more so ingrained in the repetition of how we produce it for you no know, reason. Um, so <laughs> I'm like, I'm really interested to like, to see like the earth seed, like what does it mean if mm. our primary objective on this text is to decolonize it? Um, our, and feel free to like it, respond to that in any way, but I'm also curious if there are any like other poets or wordsmiths that you uh, that you love and want to give and live by and want to give to gifts as us, because I know you have a couple other gifts you're about to give us too. Uh, the one I wish I had one that came to mind faster than Edna St. Vincent Millay, but she wrote the 14 page long uh, Renaissance poem. Um, I think she was seriously tripping on drugs. You know, all I could see from where I stood were three long mountains and a wood. And she just talks about this journey of what it was like for her to trip, but then also experience God. And um, the language is gorgeous. Uh, Who else? What else? Classics? Oh, wait. Or contemporary wordsmiths and poets too. Hold on, I just had, they're all, there's some that are right here. I've been reading a lot about hoodoo culture. And so there's a woman, her name is Lilith Dorsey, who writes about hoodoo culture um, in Spanish and in English. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Yeah, uh, in in Spanish and in English. And that has been super interesting to me. Uh, Also, just listening, like I've been reading a lot of plays by young people that in terms of rhythm are really interesting to me. Um, but as far as classics, the thing that I'm not supposed to do is blank on things that I love or like my <laughs> canon, but yay, uh, but I am. Yeah. That is a, no, that's, you've, that's, you've given us someone. I actually, everyone responding like that in the chat is like, I don't know who that is. I probably should. Um, so <laughs> that was a selfish thing for me to <laughs> have more to look up. <laughs> so I already appreciate that gift. Um, Yehan, yes. you ready? Can we do a little tarot reading? Uh, those are two different answers, but yes, I am not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Love <Let's> go. <laughs> uh, amazing. Okay, we're going to transform. Um, I know before we start, I know that you have um, some really amazing decks that you would love to share oh, and yeah. feature, and I can't wait to see them. So I'm going to be doing a little um, shuffling okay. ASMR while you um, uh, share that with us. Okay, so I couldn't find one of the decks, but... This artist, her name is Jessie Jumanji. And this isn't one of her Oracle decks. I'm gonna mm-hmm. put it, this is, I should have practiced, there we go. Yeah. That's the Flora and Fauna of Africa deck. And to show um, the artwork that I really wanna show, I also love the way, this is her um, Afro Goddess Oracle deck, the unboxing. And there's this like peach colored, uh, the bones on the outside, but it's like a gold color. Yeah. And so it has these really um, interesting pictures. Like there's uh, someone with a that's going through a library, but she's got acrylics on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this other Hoodoo Tarot deck by Tayana Lee, which I think is Mikilar. Yeah, the size is really wonderful. Uh, she wrote or did the work on this Hoodoo Tarot deck, but this is the book. Mm. Mm-hmm. And the artwork is gorgeous. She didn't do the artwork, but these are all black women. And so what this deck does, like the other deck does, is it takes uh, characters from either African-American hoodoo or Caribbean hoodoo, and it replaces some of the characters or it replaces some of the, um, so like strength is one of the major arcana. And so that one yeah. exists, but then you have here the eight of sticks instead. And so the book, oh, I feel like it's catching it exactly. And there you got it. There we go. Mm-hmm. 
the artwork. It's just beautiful. Look it up. Uh, and it's more like a watercolor that is also just a haunting kind of image of Black faces and Black stories and Black histories. And so um, what I also love is just the way that this, the Hoodoo Tarot Explanation Guide gives you, uh, and this is frustrating for me as a person who's no longer a Christian, but uh, it gives you the Bible verse because that was so much a part of Black culture like coming up after the transatlantic uh, genocide. Uh, and then it also gives you the character or the, the person, the story of the person, what they meant to African-American culture. And then it gives you the meanings in the traditional deck. And then it gives you meanings that um, are possible through the other, um, through the new book. So, yeah, That's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. I love, I love contemporary, like, adaptation. I like, just like I love um, contemporary like queerings of any and everything. I love contemporary like, let me just like paint this similar story, but with my brush. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I'll give you what I, what resonates with me and I'll like take creative liberty to change whatever I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Um, all right. I've been shuffling these cards. Um, what would you like a reading on, Yehan? Anything particular, any question, any word that you want to invoke? Oh, uh, peace. Peace, boom. Yeah. Easy. I love it. Easy. <laughs> so easy. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've been shuffling these cards and we're going to do a reading on peace. So I'm going to just be cutting the deck um, on camera. And then whenever it feels like the correct time, I want you to just say stop. Stop. <clears throat> okay, a reading on peace. Oh, beautiful. So I have drawn the moon. Mm. I'll show you this moon. <sighs> and the moon is about your intuition and your instincts. It's also about your fears. And, you know, it's the moment of night where things are kind of lit, but not really. So, <laughs> so like, it, it feels like everything could be a lot scarier than it is because we're seeing a shadowy outline instead of what's really there. But it's also a beautiful time for fantasy, right? We, just like we can imagine the horrible version of whatever that dimly lit shape is, it could also be like the tantalizing, exciting, shape-shifting, it could be so many things. There's an unease and an excitement in the not knowing of, 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 um, you know, and that's really interesting with like, ha with pursuing peace, yeah. especially when it's not something that a lot of us are privileged to feel very often, or, you know, some of us um, artists, I feel like are love to be constantly troubled. <laughs> Can I um, take that next to like my life and this morning? 100%. Okay, so um, I'm learning more about the different parts of my uh, my chart. And so my Gemini is in Venus, my Venus is in Gemini. It's about to be Gemini season. And Tomorrow. so this uh, terologist that I follow, I think got a, a reading from a while ago, said that I should focus on following the moon because for Gemini, um, for Venus and Gemini, because it's going to um, one highlight my intuition. It needs to highlight parts of my life that I haven't been um, paying attention to before. So to like get this is definitely confirmation. So thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> so now I'm gonna pair that with a little Shakespeare sonnet. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna do the same thing with our deck of sonnets. I am just cutting the deck and there. Okay. Okay, fun. This is sonnet 135. Ready? Whoever hath her wish, thou hast thy will, and will to boot, and will in overplus. More than enough am I that vexed thee still to thy sweet will making addition thus. Wilt thou, whose will is large and spacious, not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine? Shall will in others seem right gracious, and in my will no fair acceptance shine? The sea, all water, yet receives rain still, and in abundance addeth to his store. So thou, 
being rich in will, add to thy will. One will of mine to make thy large will more. Let no unkind, no fair beseechers kill. Think all but one and me in that one will. Holy shit. Uh, I love that we included this one like selfishly because I feel like I have a, you know, I have a connection to Shakespeare because I think I'm like, yeah, we're will and will. Um, and like, I ask you all these questions about this solo show because I'm working on a, on my own solo show that's, that's about will and will basically. Um, so this is like, it's so sexual. Um, it's like, it, it's, it's very much, and I love that he uses the pun and the double entendre of his own name. Um, to sort of seduce and like try and like get whoever he's written this to, to, I don't know, like give in to him in some way. But he's also saying like, you can never have too much of a good thing. He talks about abundance. Even the ocean is rained upon and receives yeah. more. And when it comes to peace and when it comes to channeling your love into whether it be one recipient or many as many as possible as many as you <laughs> there's no there's no limit i think of love as a you know an unlimited resource and i i wish that upon peace i wish peace felt you know unlimited and accessible to us and and, and maybe it is once we figured out how to access it once we know like you have learned like, oh, when I know that my body is not in peace any longer, I have to listen to it. When I, you know, whether it's that particular breath or closing your eyes or, you know, I'm working on that too. Being able to control and find a moment of peace for myself um, that feels accessible all the time. Um, I'm going to read it one more time. Um, yeah, of course. And then, you know, if you, you can close your eyes if you want. Feel free to just like let this all wash over you. And then I'd love to know um uh what jumps out at you about the sonnet anything else about the card and uh anything at all um actually i i told you to close your eyes but i lied i'm gonna have you look i'm gonna have you look at the moon card while you listen to the words but you can still let them you know wash over you as you will <laughs> whoever hath her wish thou hast thy will and wilt the boot and will in overplus more than enough am I that vexed thee still to thy sweet will making addition thus. Wilt thou, whose will is large and spacious, not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine? Shall will in others seem right gracious, and in my will no fair acceptance shine? The sea, all water, yet receives rain still, and in abundance addeth to his store. So thou, being rich in will, add to thy will, one will of mine to make thy large will more. Let no unkind, no fair beseechers kill. Think all but one and me in that one will. Uh, I'm so glad you read it again. So one of the things I was thinking is, uh, I think less connected to love but I was thinking about the show, The Magicians, you know, as we talk mm. about, have you watched it at all? <clears throat> I've heard of it, but I've never watched it. it it's super queer. And that's, it's mm. not the reason I love it, but it, the way in which it handles queerness is, is uh, uh, one of the reasons I love it. And so there's this one episode where they have to ask the moon to do something for them in order to save the world. And so then they all have to band together to do these spells to then get the yes or the no from the moon. And I, as I was watching the, um, the figure on the, the moon card, I just kept imagining like the way in which <clears throat> uh, an abundance of peace is possible if I one count on that all of the people who are doing the spells and the people who do spells in my own life to come and show up for me. And one of the things that's really funny about it is in order to get into the right space to deal with the moon, you had to get to a place of delirium you weren't allowed to sleep for five days. And so I think about like the way in which I get to that place in theater, the way in which I get to that place in art and the way in which peace is almost like a delirious state when you have realized like, oh yeah, this, I'm not trying to push myself into chaos because of uh, trauma. I'm actually just happy. And I, it's almost like a third lung. And so I'm excited about this abundance of peace um, uh, with a bunch of queer people 
in delir in a like delirious state asking for guidance from the moon. Yes. So. Um Oh, that's so cool. I love it. And I also just want to point out on this moon car, like this little rabbit that's hopping around her. Feet. Oh, yeah. Um, look at look at that little rabbit. And, you know, I rabbits, I, if I'm not mistaken, are like most active kind of around dusk and around dawn is when they're hopping around most. And it's at those moments where we see the moon come out um, and 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 this sort of like in between uh, moment of breath. That I that is that is that is just like I'm thinking about that when you're talking about yeah. delirium and the sort of peace of being neither here nor there, yeah. um, and just like existing in that uh, in the sort of limitless of the the nothingness and the limitlessness and the abundance of all of that. Um, yeah, I, it's there's I think I can't wait to see how that continues to affect like these next steps for you and finding peace. Um, I think we like we had to sort of make a lot of peace with isolation recently. And so now that we're no longer quite so isolated, one of the positive things that I was trying to bring out of uh, quarantine and isolation was uh, access to, to peace and being mm -hmm. able to manufacture and make space for peace whenever I need it. Um, so I hope that that is something that you can receive in like, in a way that feels not limited um, to you and as you. we move forward into reopening. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much for doing this with me. It was yeah. such a pleasure to hang out with you. Um, I feel like pulling the sonnet is like just telling me that um, I'm gonna be giving you an abundance of will in myself. And so I can't wait for us to be connected now and uh, you'll never get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that, yay. Uh, thank you for having me. This was wonderful. I totally needed this. And oh. thanks for, to folks for showing up and um, being here and holding space. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And I can't wait to see you soon. Soon. Bye. Bye. Friends, thank you all so much. This has been an absolute delight. Thank you to the Island Shakespeare Festival and HowlRound Theater Commons. They are our co-producers. If you enjoyed your experience today, please feel free to uh, you know, share it on social media, tell a friend. We have another episode exactly two weeks today, two weeks from tonight at the same time with writer and director Robert O'Hara, who was just Tony nominated for his Broadway debut directing Slave Play. I can't wait for that conversation. And if you can't get enough of this content, we also just released a podcast earlier this month. So we just dropped our sixth episode today. We sort of went back to the beginning of our experiment that we started in September. And we have been feeding you a, a little bit of all those old conversations. There's also some exclusive content that is available only via the podcast. So if you are interested in revisiting any of those conversations that you may have been here for, I hope you enjoy um, the extra little presents that we've got to you, uh, that we've got for you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please get masked or get vaxxed or, you know, both. That's fine too. And until the next time, please take care of yourself. Give another huge round of applause to our interpreter, Brad, who kept up with me and Yehan talking a mile a minute, but that's what he's best at. Thank you so much. Sweet dreams.